one, I remember the day she admitted to cheating on me. It wasn't even the first time. The first time, well, that was with a bunch of random strangers she met on the internet. And no, I'm not talking about a one-off mistake with one guy. I'm talking about multiple dudes, different times. She'd been hopping around chat rooms and forums like she was on some twisted scavenger hunt, collecting heartache souvenirs for me. I guess you could argue that was already a pattern, not just an isolated screw-up. But back to the story. This second time was different. Or at least, I thought it was. This time she'd found herself a co-worker. Some guy she saw every day. Someone she could actually look in the eye. It felt like an escalation. A step up in the world of betrayal. It wasn't like I sat her down and begged for the truth. I had no grand inquisition planned. It was more like she was just casually tossing me a grenade while she munched on her morning toast. You remember that co-worker I told you about? She said, as if we were talking about office gossip. Yeah? I replied, already feeling my stomach drop. Well, we've been, you know, seeing each other. And just like that, the other shoe dropped. It wasn't so much the confession that got me. It was the way she said it. Like she was mentioning a sale at the grocery store. Zero guilt. No hesitation. Just a fact of life I was supposed to accept. I didn't even know what to say. My brain was still trying to play catch-up, flipping through the mental scrapbook of our relationship, trying to figure out when it all went so damn wrong. Now, let's be clear. I'm no saint, but I didn't sign up for this kind of circus. I was thinking we were solid building something real, while she was apparently constructing some bizarre double life. But hey, I guess that's on me for being naive, right? At that point, it wasn't about whether I could forgive her again, or whether I could figure out how to fix things. No, it was more about survival. Self-preservation kicked in. I remember thinking, I need to get the fudge out of Dodge, like yesterday. I wasn't going to stick around for round three, four, or however many she had lined up. The first time I forgave her, I did it with this misplaced hope that it was a one-time thing, a lapse in judgment. That somehow, deep down, she was still the person I fell in love with. But the second time? Nah, that was a reality check. She wasn't some victim of poor choices or bad influences. This was who she was, plain and simple. So I packed up what little dignity I had left and walked away. I had no grand exit speech, no dramatic goodbye. I just left. Sometimes, that's the best you can do. To save whatever fragments of yourself you can and get out before you lose even more. Now, Michelle, if you're out there somewhere and you stumble upon this... Let me say this. I bid thee a merry fudge. Yeah, that's right. You can keep your fake apologies, your half-assed promises, and your Yahoo flipping messenger. Because seriously, of all the places, Yahoo Messenger? Who even uses that? It was like cheating on someone via fax machine or carrier pigeon. Story 2. I never thought I'd be the kind of guy who'd go through a divorce. I didn't get married with the intention of walking away when things got tough. But man, life throws curveballs. And sometimes you've got to take the hit. It started with her drinking. At first, it was just social. Nights out with friends, a glass of wine or two at dinner. But then, it became more frequent. I could see the change, and deep down, I knew it was becoming a problem. But I didn't want a divorce. I still believed that we could get through it. That we were stronger than the bottle that seemed to be taking over her life. Then came the night I found her unconscious on the bathroom floor. Her skin was a strange, sickly yellow, and she was barely breathing. I called 911 my heart pounding as I tried to keep my hands from shaking. Liver failure, they said. She slipped into a coma that night, and for weeks I sat by her hospital bed, praying for her to wake up. I didn't want a divorce. I just wanted her to survive. She did wake up eventually, and for a while it seemed like things might get better. She promised to quit drinking to get her life back on track. The hospital bills piled up, soaring past our insurance cap, but I didn't care about the money. I just wanted my wife back, healthy and happy. I didn't want a divorce. But then came the opioids. At first, they were for the pain, prescribed by a doctor who probably saw dozens of cases like hers every day. But soon, they became a crutch, another addiction to numb whatever pain she was feeling. I watched helplessly as she traded one addiction for another. I wanted to help her, to support her. I didn't want a divorce. The pills changed too, morphing from opioids to Ambien, Whatever she could get her hands on, her pill doctor got arrested and the supply dried up. That's when she turned back to the bottle. I tried everything. Rehab, therapy, even just sitting with her late at night, holding her hand and telling her we'd figure it out. I didn't want a divorce, but life doesn't wait for you to catch up. We were broke, and I was unemployed, barely able to scrape together, enough to keep food in the fridge and gas in the car. All I could think about was how to keep our son's life as normal as possible how to make sure he stayed in school and had a shot at something better. I was stretched so thin, I felt like I was going to snap. Then one day, the idea hit me. Maybe she'd be better off up north with her family, where she could get the help she needed. Maybe, just maybe, if she left, we'd all have a chance to start over. So I told her, maybe you should go back up north. Be with your family, get the help you need. And she agreed. Her brother came down with a U-Haul 
and they started packing up her thing. I felt a strange mix of relief and sadness watching her go, but I didn't say, I want a divorce, not yet. It wasn't until she turned to me, just as she was about to leave and said, I'm taking the car, our only car. We lived 13 miles from the nearest grocery store and 26 miles from our son's school. Without a vehicle, we were stranded. I looked at her and something inside me just snapped. No, I said, you're not taking the car. We argued and it got heated. Our son, caught in the middle, started yelling, telling her she couldn't just leave us without a way to get around. And that's when it happened. I said it. The words that I'd been holding back for so long, trying to avoid, hoping it wouldn't come to this. I want a divorce. She stormed out, and that was it. She left, and I stood there, feeling like the whole world had been flipped upside down. But I knew I had made the right choice. For me. For my son. For our future. The following year, I flew her back for our son's graduation. It was strange seeing her again, after everything. We were cordial, even had a decent time, and then she left. That was the last I saw of her until the divorce papers showed up in the mail. I signed them, without hesitation. Story 3 I remember the exact moment when I realized our marriage was on borrowed time. We were sitting on the couch, just an ordinary evening, talking about something trivial, maybe where to go for dinner. Out of nowhere, she turned to me and said, If you ever do anything I don't like, I'll just divorce you. No hard feelings, you know? She said it casually, like she was talking about returning a shirt that didn't fit. I was stunned. We'd been married for six years, both in our mid-thirties, and this was supposed to be it. Our forever. I loved her. I really did. But in that moment, it hit me like a punch to the gut. She didn't know what marriage meant. To her, it was a trial run. Something she could back out of if things got uncomfortable. Maybe it was because I was her first real relationship, and she didn't have anything else to compare it to. But whatever the reason... I knew right then that we were standing on different grounds. I tried to shake it off, pretend she was just talking nonsense in the heat of the moment, but it stuck with me, like a splinter in my mind. I started noticing other things too, little signs that she wasn't really committed. We had this distance between us that I couldn't close, no matter how hard I tried. Then I got laid off. It wasn't my fault. Company downsizing, they said. Still, it felt like I'd been kicked while I was already down. I came home that day, still trying to wrap my head around what had happened, and she barely looked up from her phone. A few weeks later, she asked for a divorce. No tears, no anger, just a quiet, almost business-like request. I think we should split up, she said, like she was suggesting we try a different restaurant for dinner. I knew this was coming, deep down, but it still hurt. I sat there, numb, and finally nodded. Yeah, okay, I said. There was no use fighting for something she didn't want to hold on to. We packed up our lives, dividing six years of memories like they were items on a grocery. The house was sold, furniture split, and just like that, it was over. It's funny how life can turn around, though. After the divorce, I felt like I was at rock bottom, unemployed, heartbroken, and staring at an empty future. But then, things started to change. I found a new job, better than the one I'd lost. It was challenging, fulfilling. The kind of work that made me look forward to Mondays. I threw myself into it, working late nights, putting in the effort not just to succeed but to redefine myself. And I started taking care of myself too. I joined a gym, started eating right, lost 50 pounds. It wasn't just about the weight, though. It was about feeling alive again, in control of my own story. I wasn't the same guy I'd been in that marriage. I was someone new, someone stronger. Then I met a lovely lady, kind and funny with a smile, that made me feel like everything was going to be okay. We took things slow, getting to know each other without any pressure. And you know what? It was different. There was no fear, no worry that she'd bail at the first sign of trouble. We talked about our pasts, our hopes, and somewhere along the way, I realized I'd found something real, something solid. Meanwhile, I heard bits and pieces about my ex. She'd been dumped a few times, still single, and from what I gathered, she was struggling. I felt for her, I really did. Nobody deserves to be miserable, and despite everything, I wanted her to find her happy. I guess that's the thing about love. Even when it ends, the part of you that cared doesn't just disappear. Story 4. Probably replying too late to be seen, but I guess I'll share my story anyway. It's been on my mind a lot lately, so why not? We weren't married, but we were just a few months away from sealing the deal. We had the venue booked, invitations printed, and the whole nine yards. But something had been off for a while. We were drifting apart, and it was like we were two people living separate lives under the same roof. I started noticing that I was actually happier when she wasn't around, when she was at work or out with friends, or even when she was giving me the silent treatment over some argument I couldn't even remember. It was a strange, almost guilty kind of relief. I wasn't actively looking for a reason to end it. I still thought we could fix things, that we could find our way back to whatever it was we'd lost. But man, she sure gave me plenty of reasons to reconsider. She had this way of tearing me down that I can't even describe. It wasn't just the big fights. It was the little, 
everyday jabs that slowly chipped away at me. She'd tell me I was worthless, that I'd never amount to anything. It's crazy how someone's words can get under your skin, make you doubt everything about yourself. Like a fool, I thought maybe buying a house together would help. I know, classic mistake, right? But I really believed it would be the fresh start we needed. I thought having a place to call our own, something we could build together, would bring us closer. So I went ahead and bought us a house. Big mistake. I mean, what was I thinking? Not long after we moved in, she dropped another bomb on me. You're not good enough to be a father, she said one night, like she was telling me the weather forecast. I'll never have a kid with you. That one hit hard. I'd always wanted to be a dad, to have a family. Hearing her say that was like a punch to the gut, but it also made something click in my head. I realized then that I'd been holding on to a dream that was never going to come true with her. So I told her to pack her bags and go. Pack your cow and get out. I said, which in hindsight sounds ridiculous, but I was mad, and the words just came out all twisted. I'd been helping her raise her son for years, doing more for him than she ever did. I wasn't his biological dad, but I loved that kid like he was my own. I helped him through school, went to his games, did the late-night homework sessions, and in that moment, I realized I'd been a better parent to him than she ever was to either of us. The first few months after she left were brutal. The house felt like a prison full of empty rooms and broken dreams. I'd lie awake at night, staring at the ceiling, wondering how the hell my life had ended up like this. But time has a way of healing, even the deepest wounds. Then, out of nowhere, I met someone new. I wasn't even looking for a relationship, but there she was. This amazing woman who saw something in me that I didn't even see in myself. We hit it off, and for the first time in a long while, I felt like things were going to be okay. More than okay, actually. We had our first baby last a little preemie, born three months early. She's so tiny, but she's a fighter. Just like her dad, I guess. Every time I look at her, I feel this overwhelming sense of love and hope. Like all the crap I went through was just leading me to this moment. Story 5. I was on the road for work when everything came crashing down. We'd been having problems for a while, sure. But I thought they were just bumps in the road. Every marriage has them, right? We'd been together for nine years. Married for seven, with two beautiful kids. I figured it was nothing we couldn't handle with a little effort, some compromise, and maybe a few tough conversations. Turns out she was already done mentally checked out and halfway out the door, while I was still clutching onto hope, convinced we could make it work. She never really let on how bad things were for her, led me along, making me believe we had a fighting chance. All the while, she'd already made up her mind. It was like she was waiting for the right moment to drop the hammer, maybe when I was away. So she didn't have to see the look on my face when my world fell apart. The kids were the only thing keeping me going. I didn't want them to grow up shuttling between two homes, feeling torn between their parents. I was willing to endure anything to keep our family together. I'd have done anything for those kids. I guess that's what made it so devastating when I came back from one of those work trips and found out she'd given our dog away. It was the first thing I noticed when I got home. I called for him, expecting him to come, bounding down the hall, tail wagging like always. But the house was quiet, too quiet. I asked her where he was, and she just shrugged. I gave him to the neighbor, she said, like it was no big deal. The neighbor, it turned out, had passed him along to some friend out of town, and just like that, he was gone. He was a great dog, smart as a whip, gentle with the kids, always so eager to please. He was part of the family, and she'd just gotten rid of him. No discussion, no warning, just gone. Her reason? I got tired of taking care of him. That's what she said, as if he were a piece of furniture, something you could just toss out when it became inconvenient. I spent a year looking for that dog, called shelters, put up posters, Drove around to every town within a hundred miles. I never found him. I still think about him. Wonder where he ended up. If he lived out the rest of his life in a good home. I hope he did. Because he deserved that. He loved our family and we let him down. That's something I'll never forgive myself for. Or her for that matter. That was the moment I realized she wasn't who I thought she was. How could someone just do that? Give away a loyal, loving dog without a second thought? It was like a light switch flipped in my head. And I knew then that she wasn't the person I'd marry, or maybe she was, and I just hadn't seen it. Fast forward 11 years, and life's taken us in different directions. She's been married, divorced, and remarried again. She's gone through pets like their accessories, adopting, and then dumping them when she got bored or they became too much work. 15 cats and dogs have lost count. It's like she never understood that these animals aren't just disposable. They're living beings, not furniture. The kids, though, they've turned out great, despite everything. We have a good custody arrangement, 50-50, and... They're remarkably well-adjusted. She's a decent mom, I'll give her that, but she's just awful with commitments, whether it's to husbands or pets. I'm grateful for the relationship I have with them, and I know they love both of us, even if things didn't work out the way we planned. As for me, I've been remarried for five years now to the most incredible woman on the planet. She's kind, compassionate, 
and has a heart big enough to hold everything I've been through. She knows about the dog, of course. I've told her how much it still haunts me, and she understands in a way that only someone who truly loves animals can. Story 6. I'll never forget that phone call. I was sitting on the back porch just a regular Sunday afternoon, enjoying the quiet and catching up with my kids from my previous marriage. We didn't get to see each other as much as I wanted. Weekends, holidays, the usual divorce schedule, but I always tried to make the most of it. We were talking about their plans for the summer, and I asked them when they'd like to come down for a visit. There was this long pause on the other end, and I could hear them shuffling around, like they were passing the phone back and forth, trying to figure out who had to be the one to break the news. Finally, my oldest, who was about 16 at the time, took a deep breath and said, Dad, we're not coming to visit anymore. Because of her, it felt like someone punched me in the gut. I sat there, the words echoing in my head. I knew they didn't like her my wife at the time. I'd been trying to smooth things over, walking on eggshells to keep the peace between them, thinking I could somehow manage the situation. But hearing my kids say it out loud, that they didn't want to come to my house because of her, hit me like a ton of bricks. I realized in that moment just how much I'd been fooling myself. I'd convinced myself that the tension between her and my kids was something I could fix. I thought if I tried hard enough, if I just found the right words, everything would work out. But I was wrong. I'd been so desperate to make it work to blend my old family with my new one, that I didn't see the damage it was causing. Or maybe I saw it, and just didn't want to admit it. As I sat there, trying to find something to say, I felt this wave of shame wash over me. I'd let my kids down. I'd let myself down. And for what? A relationship that was clearly beyond repair. My oldest kid, bless their heart, kept talking, saying they loved me and wanted to see me, just not with her around. It was like a dagger through my heart. When I finally hung up the phone, I just sat there for a moment. Staring out at the backyard, I knew what I had to do. I went inside, found her in the living room, and told her, We're getting divorced, just like that. No more threats, no more empty promises. I told her before that if things didn't change, I'd leave. And every time she'd say she'd try harder, that she'd be better. But nothing ever changed. This time, though, I was dead serious. And she knew it. She didn't argue. I think she saw it in my eyes, heard it in my voice. There was no fight left in me, no more energy to keep pretending this could work. She moved out within a week. It all happened so fast. One moment, we were married, and the next, she was gone. The house felt strangely empty, but also lighter, like a weight had been lifted. That was a few years ago. It took some time, but my relationship with my kids got back on track. They started coming over again, and we found our rhythm. We've got a great relationship now. I can't tell you how much it means to have them in my life. Really, in my life. Without all that tension and resentment clouding everything. And as for me, I'm still single, and honestly, I'm loving every bit of it. I've got the freedom to focus on what really matters. My kids, my own happiness, and just living my life without walking on eggshells all the time. I'm not saying I'll never get into another relationship, but right now, I'm in no rush. I've got my own space, my own peace, and that's something I never want to lose again. Story 7. There were so many moments, so many signs, that should have made me pack my bags and leave. But I guess... When you're in the middle of it all, you just keep telling yourself things will get better. You convince yourself that the good times outweigh the bad, that the rough patches are just that, temporary. Then we had our son, and for a while, I thought maybe this would be the turning point. I'd always wanted to be a dad, and holding him for the first time, I felt like everything we'd been through was worth it. Father's Day was coming up, and I was excited. It was my first one, and I know it sounds cheesy, but I was really looking forward to it. I'd been dropping hints, not for gifts or anything, just hoping for a small acknowledgement, a card, or maybe just a, hey, happy Father's Day. But the day came and went, and she didn't say a word, not a single word. I was hurt, but I tried to brush it off. Maybe she just forgot, I told myself. It happens, right? So I gently reminded her, thinking it would jog her memory, and maybe we could salvage the day. But instead of an apology or even a little guilt, she got mad, like really mad. She accused me of trying to guilt trip her, said I was making a big deal out of nothing. Then, to top it off, she told me to just go hang out with my buddy. It's just another day, she said. Go do something with him. That's when it really hit me. To me, Father's Day wasn't about presents or anything like that. It was about feeling appreciated, even just a little bit. A simple acknowledgement that, hey, you're doing a good job, but I guess she didn't see it that way. Then there were all the birthdays she forgot, every single one, year after year. I'd be lying if I said it didn't hurt. I mean, how hard is it to remember your husband's birthday? And every time I brought it up, she'd just shrug it off like I was being unreasonable for expecting her to care. Once, during one of our countless arguments, she told me I could sleep with other people if I wanted to. I don't care, she said, as if she was doing me some kind of favor. But I didn't want anyone else. I married her. I wanted to make it work with her, 
but it felt like she didn't understand that, or maybe she just didn't care. I'll never forget the time she casually said, I'd love to be a single parent someday, as if it was a totally normal thing to say. I laughed it off at the time, thinking it was just one of her weird jokes, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized she meant it. She was already halfway out the door, and I was just too blind to see it. And then there were the insults, the way she'd always try to make me feel small. She went to university, so she thought that made her better, smarter than me. Never mind that I was making good money and was part owner of a business I'd worked my ass off to build. Meanwhile, she couldn't hold down a job for more than a few months. But somehow, in her mind, I was the one who wasn't good enough. One night, when our son was still breastfeeding, she refused to feed him because she was mad at me about something. I don't even remember what it was. Probably some petty argument. He was crying and hungry, and she just sat there, arms crossed, glaring at me like I was the one who'd done something wrong. That's the night we started him on formula. It broke my heart, but I wasn't going to let my kid go hungry because of our issues. And then there was the time I went to visit a friend out of town. I was gone for 12 hours, just needed to get away for a bit clear my head. When I got back, she was sitting on the couch, scrolling through her phone. I walked in, and she didn't even look up. Didn't ask where I'd been or how my day was. It was like I hadn't even been gone. I realized then that I could disappear, and she probably wouldn't even notice. I don't know why I stayed as long as I did. Maybe I was afraid of what life would be like without her. Or maybe I just didn't want to fail at another relationship. But one day, I looked at my son and realized that this wasn't the example I wanted to set for him. I didn't want him growing up thinking that this was what a marriage was supposed to be like. So I left. It wasn't easy, and there were a lot of rough days, but it was the best decision I ever made. Now I'm still single and loving every bit of it. I've got a great relationship with my son, and I'm finally living a life that doesn't feel like a constant uphill battle. Story 8. I know I've got to own my part in how things ended. I'm not pretending I was some perfect husband because I wasn't. But here's how it went down. The whole messy story. I was deployed to Afghanistan, like so many others, doing my job and trying to keep my head on straight while the world felt like it was falling apart. I'd get these rare phone calls from back home, and everything seemed fine, or at least as fine as it could be when you're halfway around the world from your spouse. But then I found out she'd had an affair. It's a story as old as time, and unfortunately, way too common in the military. You think you're sacrificing for your country, your family, and then you get blindsided by betrayal. At the time, I was still very religious. My faith was this anchor I clung to in the chaos. So, I did what I thought was the right thing. I forgave her, or at least I tried to. I told her I didn't want to talk about it ever again, that I forgave her, but that she was on notice, so to speak. We'd try to make it work, move forward, pretend the ground wasn't shaking beneath our feet. But forgiveness is a funny thing. It's not as simple as saying the words and flipping a switch. We struggled for the next two years, both of us pretty much at rock bottom. She never believed me when I said I'd forgiven her. And to be honest, maybe she was right. Maybe I hadn't really forgiven her in my heart, because trust once broken is hard to rebuild no matter how much you want to. She was scared I'd cheat on her to get back at her, like I'd stoop to the same level just to even the score. That fear turned into jealousy and then into control. She didn't want me around other women, even just talking to them. No female friends, no chatting with other female soldiers in my unit, not even a smile or a hello. It felt like I was living under a microscope. Every interaction scrutinized, every look misinterpreted. It drove a wedge between us that just kept growing. I get it though, guilt makes people act crazy makes them see things that aren't there. But I wasn't looking for revenge. I was just trying to keep it together. That jealousy was a big factor in our divorce. But it wasn't the tipping. The truth is, I had my own demons. Coming back from deployment, I was angry, messed up in the head. I'd leave work and buy a couple of 40s, just sit in the parking lot and drink instead of going home to her. I couldn't face the mess we'd become. Didn't know how to fix it. The anger was like this fire inside me, threatening to burn everything down. I never raised a hand to her or even my voice but I'd get to a point where I knew I was about to snap. So I'd leave, disappear for a couple of days to cool off. Was it the best solution? Probably not. But it kept me from crossing lines I couldn't uncross. Eventually, I got tired of living like that. Tired of the constant tension and the feeling that everything I did was wrong. I volunteered for a tour of duty in South Korea. I thought maybe the distance would help, give us some space to think, to breathe. But within a week of being gone, I got the news. She'd been with another man, again. And that was it for me. The last straw, the final nail in the coffin of whatever was left of our marriage. I knew we'd gotten married too young, that we hadn't really known what we were getting into. Maybe if I'd been a better husband, or if I'd handled things differently, it would have turned out another way. But you can drive yourself crazy with all the what-ifs. The truth is, we weren't good for each other. I had my issues, my anger, and she had hers. We were two broken people trying to make something work that was beyond fixing. Story 9. 
I remember the day I found out my wife had been unfaithful like it was yesterday. We had what most people would consider a good marriage, or at least I thought so. We were close in every sense of the word, very active in our intimate life, five to seven times a week without fail. I figured that meant we were doing fine. I thought that part of our relationship was strong, solid, and that it would keep us safe from this kind of betrayal. So when I found out she'd been cheating, it felt like the ground opened up beneath me. It wasn't just the act itself that crushed me. It was the shock, the disbelief. How could this happen? How could she do this when I thought everything was fine, even great? It felt like I'd been living in one reality, and suddenly, without warning, I was thrown into another one where nothing made sense anymore. I confronted her, of course. There were tears and apologies, the usual script you see in movies and read about in books, but I didn't want to hear it. There was nothing she could say that would change what she'd done. Why? I asked, though deep down, I knew the answer didn't matter. There was no justification. No excuse that would make it okay. She stammered through some explanation about feeling disconnected or needing validation. But it all sounded hollow, like she was reciting lines from some bad play. In my mind, infidelity is the ultimate betrayal. Once a cheater, always a cheater. I don't believe in second chances when it comes to this. Maybe some people can work through it. Rebuild the trust that was shattered. But not me. Cheating isn't a mistake you make on a whim. It's a deliberate choice. It's the most blatant disregard for your spouse the person you vowed to love and honor. It's a conscious decision to throw all of that away. For what? A few moments of excitement? It's the absolute destruction of everything a marriage is supposed to stand for. I filed for divorce a week later. I didn't want to drag it out. Didn't want to sit around in the ruins of what used to be our life together, pretending like we could fix it. I know some people might call that impulsive, but to me, it was the only option. Staying would have been a lie, and I didn't want to live a lie. I told her there was no coming back from this, that once you break that kind of trust, it's gone for good. I have to say, what really got to me was the cowardice of it all. If you're going to cheat, at least have the decency to end the marriage first. Tell your spouse you're unhappy, that something's missing, that you want out. Don't go sneaking around, pretending everything is fine, while you're betraying them behind their back. Grow a pair and be honest, or get messed up when the truth comes out. That's how I see it. It's not the cheating itself that's the most painful, though that's bad enough. It's the lies, the deceit, the complete disregard for the person you supposedly love. People talk about forgiveness, about letting go and moving on. And I get that. I really do. But I'm just not built that way. I don't have it in me to forgive something like that. For me, trust is like a glass vase. Once it's shattered, you can try to glue it back together, but it will never be the same. The cracks will always be there, visible to anyone who looks close enough. And that's no way to live. The weeks after I filed were a blur, a whirlwind of paperwork, moving out, dividing up the life we'd built together. Friends and family were shocked, of course. They didn't see it coming, just like I had. On the outside, we looked like the perfect couple. But I guess that's the thing about infidelity. It's a betrayal that hides in plain sight until the day it all comes crashing down. I wish I could say there was some great moment of catharsis, some dramatic scene where I found peace or forgiveness, but there wasn't. It was just a slow, painful process of accepting that the person I thought I knew was capable of something I'd never imagined. And that's a tough pill to swallow, no matter how strong you think you are. Story 10. I was standing next to one of my best friends, just chatting and joking around, when his wife, his brand new wife, leaned over and said something that made my stomach drop. Of course it's broken if their mechanic is a Mexican. She said it with this venom in her voice, dead serious and angry not a hint of irony or humor. I turned and looked at my buddy, and the shock on his face was like a punch in the gut. He was a good guy, kind and open-minded, and in that split second, I saw the realization hit him. I think that's the exact moment he knew he'd made a huge mistake marrying. You could see it in his eyes, this mixture of disbelief and horror. He was probably thinking, who is this person I just promised to spend the rest of my life? It was like he'd been slapped awake from some dream where everything seemed perfect. And now he was staring straight into a nightmare. I knew she wasn't joking either. We'd all been standing around for a while, waiting for the ski lift to come back on, and the frustration was palpable. But that didn't excuse her comment. Not by a long shot. It was like she couldn't even help herself. The words just came out, as if she'd been waiting for an excuse to say something like that. And that's when I realized she wasn't just frustrated with the situation. This was who she was. Deep down. The kind of person who sees a problem and immediately jumps to blaming someone based on their race. My friend looked at me and I could tell he was embarrassed, not just for her, but for himself. It was like he was saying, I'm sorry you have to hear this. I'm sorry I didn't see this coming. But honestly, who could blame him? They'd gotten married so fast, just over a year after they'd met. I knew why, too. She was stunning, like the kind of woman who turns heads wherever she goes, and my buddy had been completely swept off his feet. He wasn't thinking with his head, 
at least not the right one, and he'd jumped into this marriage without really knowing who she was. It's not like there weren't signs, though. We'd all seen little things here and there, comments that made us raise an eyebrow or two. But you know how it is. Love makes you blind to stuff like that. You rationalize. You make excuses. You convince yourself that maybe you're just overreacting. I think he did a lot of that. He was so head over heels that he ignored the warning signs, the little red flags that were trying to wave him off. But standing there at the ski lift, in that moment, I think all those little red flags combined into one giant banner that screamed, Get out while you still can! And get out, he did. It took a few more months, but they ended up divorcing about six months into their marriage. It was a whirlwind romance that crashed and burned just as quickly as it had started. The more he got to know her, the more he realized they were on completely different pages. Hell, they weren't even in the same book. The divorce wasn't exactly a surprise to any of us who knew him well. If anything, we were relieved he finally saw the light before things got even more complicated like with kids or finances. Even now, years later, he's still the same around women. An idiot, really. He's got this thing where he goes for the flashy, high-maintenance types, the ones who look like they walked straight out of a magazine. And it's dangerous, especially now that he's got some serious money to his name. He's a hedge fund manager, pulling in more cash than I can even wrap my head around. That kind of wealth, combined with his weakness for a pretty face, is like a ticking time bomb. He's a good guy with a big heart, but he's just terrible at picking women. He's like a moth to a flame drawn to the glitz and glamour, completely ignoring the fact that it usually comes with a whole lot of crazy. I try to talk to him about it sometimes, remind him of what happened with his first marriage, but he just laughs it off. He says he's older and wiser now, but I'm not so sure. I think he's just hoping that the next one will be different, that he'll somehow find the one who's beautiful and grounded and good for him. I hope he does for his sake, but I also know that old habits die hard, and sometimes people just don't learn until they've been burned a few more times. Story 11 I was deployed to Iraq in 2009. I know, I know, there are probably a hundred stories just like this one out there, but it's still my story, and it still hurt like hell. My wife moved in with her mom in Texas while I was gone so we could save some money. Seemed like a smart idea at the time, with me being overseas and all, but about two months in, things started feeling off. It was nothing I could put my finger on at first, just this gut feeling. I'd scroll through her Facebook whenever I could get some downtime, and I kept seeing this guy popping up on her profile, commenting on her pictures, liking all her posts. Nothing overtly suspicious, but enough to make me wonder. I asked her about it, tried to keep it casual, but she blew up, told me I was just being jealous and paranoid, that it was just a friend, and I needed to relax. It turned into a big fight. You know how it goes. Me on one end of the world, her on the other, both of us shouting into a phone line with thousands of miles and a war between us. A little while after that, she sends me an email. I remember it vividly. She wrote that she had a crush on one of her friends, like she was confessing something cute, not admitting to something that was about to rip me apart. I called her as soon as I read it, furious and hurt. What the hell does that mean? I asked. Another fight. Bigger this time. I was desperate to hold things together, so I suggested counseling when I got home. I told her she couldn't keep hanging around this guy. Seemed like a reasonable request, right? But she refused. Said he was part of her only group of friends. That she couldn't just cut them off. Blah, blah. I thought to myself, but I was stuck over there fighting a war, and there wasn't much I could do from thousands of miles away. So I did what I thought was the best thing at the time. I conceded. I dropped it. I told myself I was just being paranoid, that I needed to focus on my job and stop letting this mess distract me. But the truth is, I felt helpless. The fighting was messing with my head, and I couldn't afford to be distracted out there. My mind needed to be on the mission, not on what might be happening back in Texas. Then I had this bright idea one night to check our cell phone bill. I don't know what made me do it. Maybe it was just a moment of clarity. Or maybe I just wanted to see the proof, one way or another. I looked through the call logs and sure enough, there was this one number showing up over and over again at all hours of the night. I called it, and a dude answered. I didn't even have to ask who he was. It was like the pieces of the puzzle just clicked into place all at once. But what was I supposed to do from Iraq? So I just tucked that knowledge away, shoved it to the back of my mind, and tried to focus on getting through my deployment. When I finally came home, things were okay. She was a little distant, but I was just glad to be back on U.S. soil, back with her. I told myself we could get through this, that we could fix it, but there were signs, little things. She was acting shady with her phone, getting weird texts from a girl named Ashley, saying stuff like, babe, and I love you. I remembered the call logs, remembered that I knew she'd been talking to some guy while I was gone, but I ignored it. I didn't want to deal with it. I just wanted someone to be there when I came home, someone to hold, someone to make me feel like I wasn't alone. But after a few days of trying to pretend everything was normal, I couldn't take it and I confronted. At first, she lied, like I knew she would. She always did that, 
made me feel like I was the crazy. But eventually, she came clean, admitted she'd been talking to, seeing him. All those months I'd been halfway around the world, putting my life on the line, and she was cheating. We separated right before Christmas and divorced by the spring. Looking back, I see how I'd been ignoring reality. I was clinging to this fantasy that things were okay that we could get through it. But the truth was right in front of me, and I didn't want to see it. I just wanted to get through the deployment, get back home and have things be normal. But normal wasn't an option anymore. The worst part? I don't even know if I was angrier at her for cheating or at myself for ignoring it for so long. I think I just needed to believe there was something good waiting for me when I got back. Something solid in a world that felt like it was crumbling around me. Story 12. Things started off fine. We had a couple of drinks, chatted with some folks, and everything seemed normal. But then, as the night went on, she started hitting the drinks harder than usual. I'm talking about one glass of wine, then another. And before I knew it, she was downing shots with the groomsmen. I'm no prude. I like to party too. But I could see where this was headed. I'd been down this road with her before. The reception was in full swing when the DJ called for the bride and groom's first dance. You know how it is. Everyone gathers around the dance floor, watching the happy couple have their moment. It's a special thing and people take it seriously. I was sitting at our table, sipping a beer, and I noticed she wasn't next to me. I glanced around and then, there she was, staggering out onto the dance floor, making a beeline for the bride and groom. I thought, no, she wouldn't, but then she did. She barged right into their first dance, laughing and trying to join in like it was no big deal. The bride and groom looked shocked, but they tried to smile through it, clearly uncomfortable. And there I was, sitting at the table with everyone around me staring daggers at her, then glancing over at me, like I was somehow responsible for this train wreck. I just sipped my beer and shrugged. What was I supposed to do? I didn't know anybody there, and honestly, at that point, there was no stopping. I felt embarrassed for her, sure, but I'd learned that trying to reel her in when she got like that was a losing battle. She was way past that point, dancing like a tornado, completely oblivious to the tension in the room. After a couple of minutes that felt like hours, she tripped over her own feet and ended up sprawled out on the floor. People were gasping, whispering and I knew it was time to step in. I peeled her off the dance floor, her dress a mess, her hair all over the place, and half carried her out to the car. She was giggling and slurring something about how much fun she was having, totally unaware of the scene she'd just caused. I got her in the passenger seat, handed her a bottle of water, and told her to drink it. But of course, in typical fashion, she just dumped it out on the floorboard. It wasn't the first time, and I'm sure it wouldn't be the last. I remember gripping the steering wheel, taking a deep breath, and just staring out at the dark road ahead, wondering how the night had gone so sideways. We drove home in silence. Her passed out in the seat next to me. I was half laughing, half shaking my head, because what else can you do? I mean, yeah, it was a disaster, but it was almost comically bad. The kind of thing you look back on and shake your head at thinking, what the hell was that? Story 13. I'll admit at first her beauty and charm had me completely under her spell. You know how it is when someone's got that magnetism? pulling you in before you even know what's happening. And maybe for a little while, you overlook things. Brush off those red flags because, well, you think you can handle Or maybe you convince yourself you're imagining things. But with her, it wasn't long before the cracks started showing. Besides the narcissism, there was this unpredictable violence that would erupt from nowhere, like a sudden storm. One minute, she'd be perfectly fine, maybe even sweet. And the next, she'd be tearing into me over the smallest thing. The outbursts came fast and hard. I couldn't even track what set her off half the time. Sometimes it'd be something as small as a crooked picture frame or a dish left on the counter. But it wasn't just the violence, no. It was how she'd punish me. Not like the normal arguments where couples get mad and cool off. Oh no. She had a gift for finding ways to make you suffer, and she got real creative with it. Cold, calculated punishments that would leave you second-guessing every move you made, always waiting for the next one. I remember one time I'd forgotten to pick up milk after work. That's it, just milk. I'd been running late, juggling a million things in my head, and it slipped my mind. When I walked in the door and she asked where the milk was, I explained it had just slipped my mind. She didn't say a word after that, just turned her back and went about her business, stone cold. At first, I thought she was just annoyed and would get over it, but then a day passed, and she didn't speak a single word to me, not one. Now, I've got to tell you, after a few days of her silence, I actually started enjoying it. Weird, right? But the peace of not having her bark at me over every little thing was like being on vacation. It was as if the weight of always having to tiptoe around her emotions was suddenly lifted. For an entire week, she didn't say a thing to me, and I was in heaven. Pure bliss. I could come home from work and just sit in the quiet. No nagging, no criticisms, no random, unpredictable tirades. It was the calmest I'd felt in years. But then, 
The seventh day rolled around, and she finally broke her silence. Are you ready to apologize? She asked, arms crossed, eyes daring me to defy her. It was such a small sentence, but it was loaded with all the self-righteousness she carried around. In her mind, she'd won. I was supposed to grovel, apologize for my so-called crime of forgetting milk, and everything would go back to the way it was. Her in control, me walking on eggshells. But something clicked in that moment. Something I hadn't really allowed myself to see until then. I realized I was done. It wasn't the forgotten milk, or the silent treatment, or even the violent outbursts that had gotten to it. It was something much deeper. It was the constant drain she had become. She robbed me of my peace, my solitude, and gave nothing in return. No companionship, no love, just this constant pull of negativity. I had been putting up with it for so long that I had forgotten what it felt like to be free of it. That one week of silence had reminded me just how much I missed that peace, that solitude, and how much I needed it back. So when she asked if I was ready to apologize, I didn't say a word. Instead, I reached into my bag and handed her the divorce papers I'd been sitting on for months, too afraid to pull the trigger. Her eyes went wide for a second, a flicker of shock. But then, just as quickly, she masked it with her usual cool indifference. Why? she asked, her voice flat, emotionless, like she was genuinely puzzled by the whole thing. And so I told her, plain and simple, because you rob me of solitude, but provide me with no companionship. I don't think she fully understood what I meant by that. Maybe she never would. To her, everything was about control. The idea that someone could want solitude, that being alone could be better than being with her, probably didn't make sense in her. But for me, handing her those papers was like reclaiming my life. The silence that followed wasn't the same as the punishment she'd tried to impose on me. It was a silence filled with possibility, a quiet that held freedom rather than fear. After she left, there was no big dramatic scene, no tears, no shouting. She took the papers, glanced at me with an expression I couldn't quite read, and then walked out the door. It was the last time I saw her, and honestly, I felt lighter the second it closed behind her. Funny thing is, I still forget to pick up the milk sometimes, but now I just laugh it off. There's no more fear, no more walking on eggshells, just peace.